Thanks everybody for joining us today for our first webinar of 2024. Um, my name is Jessica Smith. I'm the Foundation's Communications and Campaign Associate. Um, this webinar today is called Works in Action, Re Reconciliation with Indigenous Peoples. Um, and we are so glad that you are here with us today. Um, I want to start um, by just saying if you could um, keep yourself on mute um, until we get to the question part, um, and then if you have a question, you can you can raise your hand or let us know that you'd like to speak. Otherwise, um, if you could keep yourself on mute, that would be great. Um, and um, that way, it doesn't change the uh, person on the screen uh, when when folks are talking. Um, and I want to acknowledge that today, the land that I'm on is the traditional land of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, um, and it's covered by Treaty 13A, Head of the Lake Purchase. Um, and because we're heading into Indigenous Language Month um, in a couple days, I also want to uh, lift up and honor that there are many um, different languages spoken across this territory and across the whole of the country. Um, we're at a crucial time in the life of the church, the history of our country, um, and for, for more than 30 years, uh, the United Church and Indigenous peoples have been on a journey towards mutuality, respect, uh, equity, reconciliation, justice, um, through the powerful testimonies that are shared by residential school survivors and their families. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission unveiled a history that is uh, not simply about misguided and profoundly abusive attempts to assimilate Indigenous peoples, but it's a colonial legacy that continues today, uh, making itself known in inequities and injustices and in, in areas like uh, education and child welfare, um, gender-based violence, violation of the treaty and nation-to-nation -nation rights across the country, um, and resource extraction across Indigenous lands. Um, the TRC confirmed for Canada that the path towards reconciliation is unquestionably the path towards justice. So in recognition for that need for justice, the foundation chose to engage reconciliation with Indigenous peoples as one of our four foundation priorities um, in 2022. Um, seeking recon reconciliation with Indigenous communities will involve action, humility, a dedication to addressing um, our past actions as a church. Um, so we have committed as an organization to work with the church to support reconciliation and Indigenous justice initiatives, uh, reflect on and respond to the TRC's calls to action, and contemplate and discern on the calls to the church uh, from Indigenous caretakers. Um, so this, this uh, webinar today is, is one of the ways that we're moving that work forward and we want to lift up and spotlight um, some of the, the, the many uh, important projects that are happening across our church uh, as we work towards reconciliation. So I'm going to introduce um, our moderator for today's discussion, Royal Ord. Royal's um, on the foundation board and he's the chair of the Joint Grants Committee. So he is from, very familiar with all of these projects um, and the work that it uh, took to, um, to, to get them to funding. And uh, he's going to uh, engage them, our panelists today, um, in a conversation about the projects and about the, um, how they worked with the foundation as well. So Royal, I'm gonna toss it over to you and um, that's it for me. Thanks very much, Jess. Uh, thanks not only for that introduction, but also for bringing this all together, coordinating this webinar. Um, as you mentioned, this is one in a series where we're taking a look at some of the projects in local communities of faith where the foundation has been able to partner with people with great, innovative, effective, um, faithful ideas. Uh, and that, uh, that's certainly the case with the three projects we're going to be focusing on today. Just to give everybody a quick sketch of how we're going to spend the next hour together, because we will wrap at one o'clock, um, we're going to start by inviting representatives of the three projects we have with us today to talk just a little bit about their project. We've asked them to try and keep it to a couple of minutes, and I know that's a challenge because these are 
wonderful projects. And so even if in the first couple of minutes we don't get to all the details, I think we'll have a chance to circle back and, and pick up some of those things as we discuss them further and receive your questions as well. So a couple of minutes from each project, just in terms of what they're doing and their local community of faith. Um, and then we're going to go into a bit of an exchange amongst these, uh, these four people with us from these three projects, just talking about how these projects fit into the mission and ministry of their local communities of faith, as well as the impact they're starting to see from them. Then we're reserving a good chunk of time for you to ask your questions, to react to some of the things you've heard, share your observations about where we are on this path towards reconciliation with Indigenous people as the United Church of Canada. Okay, so that's the quick sketch, and I uh, hope you're already starting to think about some of the things you'd like to share with us when we get to that segment of the, of the program. But let me start by turning in no particular order here, maybe with Michael Schuberg from the Five Oaks Center in Brantford. Michael, could you lead off with telling us a bit about your project? Sure, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and uh, I just wanted to start off to let you know that Five Oaks is one of three uh, education retreat centers across uh, Canada serving uh, in education and retreat for many, many different peoples. And we're a place of radical hospitality. And we continue to serve as an incorporated ministry of the United Church focused on a renewed vision as an intercultural interfaith retreat center, working primarily with the United Church communities, with local indigenous communities and local Muslim communities. And Five Oaks continues to lean into its vision best captured in the following statements of radical hospitality, embracing difference, environmental stewardship, right relationship, and social justice. Five Oaks programs embody all of these values and invite our own programs as well as hosted groups or our rental groups to live into these same principles. Five Oaks offers outdoor education and core programming that unveil justice and equity, offer connection to the land, nurture personal and spiritual growth, and offers meaningful, impactful dialogue and believes in strength and togetherness. We are really grateful to receive uh, one of these grants from the Foundation Seeds of Hope grant uh, focusing on decolonization. And we were able to do two things uh, with this grant. One, we were able to write, pilot, and de deliver decolonization themes into our Diversity on the Land school program which is a program that works with local schools to help students unpack uh, diversity uh, in their classroom through div the diversity of the forest. And secondly, to launch and deliver a learning series, uh, which I'll talk mostly about today, uh, which we've delivered currently two of three programs in a series developed called Decolonization for Christian Settlers and also Where Cultures Meet. So we've applied uh, the framework uh, to these programs, and uh, we're really excited to see what has come out of that. Um, and I think that that's probably my two and a half minutes right there. I'm going to have lots of opportunities later to share more details about those programs, but uh, we're really excited to have been able to really have the opportunity to deepen into and develop curriculum and content that uh, works towards right relationships. How is that, Royal? Well, we'll look forward. That's great, Michael. Thank you very much. And we will look forward to digging a little deeper into that. So uh, as I said, no particular order, but maybe I'll invite Ian, Ian McLean from Peachland United in Peachland, BC. Can I just say Peachland sounds kind of like the Garden of Eden, you know? <laughs> you walk we get out, your door, you get, we walk get out the right, door yeah. and you pick, pick a peach. Um, but, but, but please, Ian, give well, us a right sense up. of your part of the country and your community of faith. Excellent. Thank you. My name is Ian and I do live in Peachland on Okanagan Lake, uh, not far from Kelowna and, and between Kelowna and Penticton. If you're, so it is, a, it is a lovely spot. I'm in ministry with the folks at Peachland United Church and it's an honor to be here with you all. So great. Um, and yes, uh, boy, that's a tough act to follow for a couple of minutes, but um, I'm going to see if I can share uh, this very quickly. Uh, excellent. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar, if, if you haven't, uh, uh, I'm sure many of you have taken or been involved in a blanket exercise before. This is a Kairos-sponsored uh, uh, project. Uh, it's been available for, gosh, um, 15 or so years now. I'm a facilitator for the blanket exercise. I've been trained, so I wanted to bring this um, uh, to Peachland. I've led, uh, helped lead some other exercises. Really a wonderful experience, uh, we'll maybe again talk more, but when we're in this time of trying to understand where to move forward in reconciliation, I, I think that this particular um, 
exercise and involvement with uh, lay people is probably still one of the best to help us uh, debunk and demystify so much of what is uh, rhetoric and misunderstanding of Indigenous people since uh, colonization. It leads us through, we start off with uh, a gathering and circle, as you'll see here with uh, folks, the, the beauty and the uh, eloquence, I guess, of this exercise. It is rather than a workshop of curing things, it is a participatory experience. The blankets uh, on the floor here that you'll see represent Canada prior to colonization. And the folks here are having a bit of a debrief uh, just to tell them what will go on during the exercise. We then all stand, uh, stand up and stand on the blankets as uh, facilitators take us through a variety of, um, of the history since decolonization. Uh, some of it is kind of hard facts. The facts that uh, really the government of Canada, almost from the, the get-go, really did see Indigenous people as um, barriers to what the government really wanted to see um, as far as land entitlements, um, as was mentioned by Jess at the beginning, resource extraction, all those kinds of things became very well known that the Indigenous folks were barriers to where the government wanted to go. A variety of things happened, including uh, some proclamations, the Indian Act, which moved uh, Indigenous people onto specific tracts of land, so they lost a lot of their land base. They were told by statute not to practice their um, Indigenous uh, activities and experiences, spiritual practices such as the potlatch, they were outlawed. Um, in came disease from settlers such as tuberculosis, um, uh, and smallpox, which reduced the population. And as we go through this exercise, what tends to happen is the, the land um, has been reduced. And what happens is as we participate through this exercise is the facilitators, including myself, start to uh, roll up the blankets, if you like, and people are, are encouraged to get a lot closer together. And the land that is uh, lost is then um, rolled up in these blankets and folks uh, through various different uh, announcements during scrolls that are read are asked to be seated. So you actually see before you the land reduced and, okay. and people uh, have to sit down. Okay. Ian, thank you. I'm sorry that to, to, to cut that short, but as I say, we're going to come back and have a chance to talk in more okay. detail about that's the, that's the impact. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Ian, thank you very much. Welcome. Again, so, sorry to push on this one, but as I say, there's lots of ground we need to cover and lots of voices we'd like to hear. Okay. Shauna Kennedy and Tony Snow from McDougal United in Calgary, Alberta. Um, Shauna, Tony, I'm not sure who's going to lead off here, but great to have you both with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I'm Shauna Kennedy. I'm the in, I'm the uh, I'm the right relations lead. That's what I am. The right relations lead at McDougal United Church, and so I've been working closely with Reverend Tony Snow over the last several years on Indigenous-led projects for our community and for our region. And I'll, I have some slides, but I think I'll save them for for after. But um, yeah, I'll let uh, I'll let Tony introduce himself too. Uh, greetings. Uh... Tony Snow, I have my, I'm on a weak signal here, so I have my uh, camera off. One of the things that I think is really important for the work that we're doing at McDougal is uh, this outreach and involvement of Indigenous uh, people in the urban setting and those that are from various communities that have been affected by the United Church. So doing some outreach and relationship building, helping to respond to community need and to uh utilize our resources to help facilitate some support for community resiliency projects and for uh, cultural awareness for the community, for the church, and to build that uh, writing writing relationship portion. I think that is necessary for us. But thank you for, for allowing us to, to come and to be part. Back to you, Shauna. Um, yeah, so we were asked to talk about our 2021 year that we got, we received a, a Seeds of Hope grant that we were really grateful to have. And with that grant, we did uh, three projects. 
we did a round dance a with the community. So that would have been a reconciliation event with Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, members. Um, and this happened shortly after the 215 children's graves were discovered in Kamloops. Um, so there was a lot of grief in the community at that time and a lot of, um, I think, interest in people coming together. And it was also kind of COVID was easing off. Uh, so it was a really uh, di different kind of a year for us that year, deal dealing with those types of things. But um, yeah, so our three projects were the round dance, a ribbon skirt workshop uh, for indigenous for indigenous women to learn and regain their culture, and also a cultural sensitivity uh, seminar that we had designed for staff and and the leadership of the church. So it was an anti racism and cultural sensitivity for for the congregation and the staff and leadership to learn and grow and understand uh, a bit better about um, the history of our area and and why these kind of projects are so important and impactful. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you all for, for that, for, for accepting that challenge of presenting your rich projects in, in, in minimal detail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just want to say again how you know, I sit on the Joint Grants Committee, I chair the Joint Grants Committee, how excited we were to receive a, a number of these projects, including your projects, um, and how enthusiastic we were that we were able to partner with you to try and have an impact locally the way you have you have all had. But let me just sort of open up now a bit of a general conversation. And this these questions aren't directed to anybody, just anybody from this group, pick them up and kind of carry them forward. And I guess the first is an obvious question. Where did the inspiration come from in terms of the projects that you undertook? Like what was happening in your communities of faith such that this seemed like the time for you to try this and to approach the foundation to see if there was some resource to support that? So. And anyone from among you, could you just talk a little bit about where this, where your idea, where your project came from within your community of faith? No one jumping up. So Michael, maybe you could talk a bit about it, because it sounds like this comes out of a deep tradition of the kind of project that you did, but still was a kind of a new emphasis on reconciliation. Yeah, so... Five Oaks and its new strategic plan uh, has highlighted right relationship as one of our key priorities uh, for the center. And just to note that the center provide supports communities of faith and individuals within the denomination and outside uh, to engage in dialogue and meaningful retreat experiences around uh, these sort of topics and conversations around these movements towards towards flourishing. And there's two that I really wanted to highlight. One is that Five Oaks invites participants to step into a world where social justice equity and the profound respect for human rights forms the foundation of everything that we do. So our programs are crafted to empower individuals and to foster that sense of inclusive inclusivity, to foster that sense of, of right relationship. We also invite participants to journey into that space that celebrates this kind of diversity that we're talking about from our own sort of human experience. So we create environments where personal and spiritual growth flourish sort of side by side. So this decolonization course was this, it was this very practical, like it was the Christian settlers in a room with Professor Derek Suderman. We were literally flipping through the Bible, you know, working on like, what is the root of why Christians believed, you know, they could be, have this sort of superiority complex and, and dominate in that way. So it was, you know, it was a really hard time. And that was matched with this meaningful opportunity for retreat of deep reflection. And so people came out of that changed and empowered to go deeper when they went home. So that's, that's sort of that action reflection model we're using. Very exciting. Ian, you mentioned, as I think most of us know, the blanket exercise has existed for a while now, but you obviously decided this was the time in at Peachland United, and, and there was something you were going to be able to do with it, which either kind of revisited its strengths or kind of pushed into new territory. Could you maybe right. talk about where the idea for your project came from? Sure. Um, primarily, I think we, uh, in the last three or four years, we... Uh, included in our opening worship a uh, reconciliation candle. Um, we talk about whose land we are and uh, prayerfully acknowledge our land and the need for further reconciliation. Through that time, I've been getting a number of questions, basically, which uh, in summary are, look, why are we, why are we continually doing this? And, and uh, misunderstanding about 
um, really where we are in, in relationship. So I knew the blanket eye exercise could lead us through those kind of basic things. It's a wonderful um, indication of, of the history and truth. So it allows individuals to actually get some of the facts where we were in colonization, we're gone, we need to go and further so that, and I have noticed that actually, that uh, folks through that and some other things we're doing are now a little bit more comfortable in understanding why we need to do further work because the truth of those, um, uh, of history is now a bit more uh, known to them. So it's been very helpful in that regard. Well, but, and, and as you explained, and I think anyone who's been through the blanket exercise knows, it's also kind of like visual. There's something about like participating in it bodily, which <laughs> sort of makes the point in a way that a, you know, a lecture or a discussion or a panel would, would not make. So it's, it, there's a, there's a participatory element to which is, to it, which is effective. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, uh, Seminars are great, but when you actually stand up and be, and you're a part of something, we, we get those comments all the time in any little exercise I've done. People are, are really um, moved by that experience and take home actually more, I think, being a participant. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, so Shauna and Tony, maybe to turn to you, thank you for reminding us about that particular reality of Indigenous relationship in an urban context, um, and that's clearly what you're focusing on. So could you also, like, like, your, like the, your friends here, talk a little bit about where the idea came from, how you kind of focused in on those three specific elements of a larger project on reconciliation? I think I'll just add, uh, and Shauna can add her, her part in this, um, a lot of the work that we were doing at McDougall and in the community were around uh, some of the observances that were going on in Calgary for uh, missing and murdered women and for uh, especially around the um, Kamloops 215, how important it was for uh, community response and, and to be heard in the community. And so all of these observances brought us out into some of the actions that were happening, setting up vigils and, and working and talking with people. These uh, allowed us to interact with uh, various community members and to look at things that what was missing in their uh, experience in the city. And so one of the things uh, in, in community that children would have would be an initiation ceremony to be entering into the powwow. And so by having a fracture of their history and their past, many Métis children, many children didn't come out of a, a particular community or couldn't be at their community if they were from far away uh, to do these type of things and to offer that to them to kind of build up uh, an experience for the children about be about entering into the power in one of these cultural, um, uh, culturally significant times in a child's life and something that we remember as Indigenous people coming into our, our own in, in community to offer that to those that would never have that experience or because of the history of colonialism have been uh, separated from that experience. So trying to find ways to uh, build up that resiliency in the, in the ribbon skirts uh, uh, workshop was also in the same vein. So turn to Shauna. Like I find that interesting, Shauna, just in a moment, I'll come back to you. But but what you're talking about, Tony, is um, like it, it's 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 program based in the sense of you're, you're you're creating the content. But it's almost more like you're you have a ministry of space. You know, like you're you're just creating a space, providing a space, uh, lending a space, opening a space. So it's, it's that's as very, talk, very it good observation. Yeah. And, and yeah. one of so, the so, things so, that's from my ministry, uh, oftentimes because I'm male, I do not step into uh, where where women's issues come up. So for the missing and murdered women and for uh, things like women's resiliency, cultural practices, it is trying to open that space to allow for those voices and those practitioners to come in to support them in what they're doing and to allow them to uh, do the work that they need to do, which would another, otherwise not be supported. And so this grant really helped in uh, facilitating that conversation and in building up some of the trust from the community to see that the church is actually doing something meaningful and that that, uh, that the people care about. Thanks, Tony. Shauna, maybe if you could also kind of give your perspective on how those three specific projects ended up being the projects that you did. Sure. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try and share my <laughs> PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so uh, like Tony said, they're responding to needs and every project that we do, um, 
did I sh end up sharing it? The power. I can see. I can see. Yeah, I can see an, a, a picture of four people standing in front of what I assume um, is uh, is uh, McDougal United. Oh, okay, so if I just maybe if I play the, yeah. So, um, so this. Five people. Yeah, this photo just demonstrates our teamwork. When in the 2021 year, uh, Marilyn Agnew was the uh, right relations lead, and now I am. But all of our projects are, um, I would say they're indigenous led, but they're collaborative. They're they're we all brainstorm together, and we all get our ideas out. But we're responding specifically to the TRC calls to action for churches. And we're responding to the needs in the community. And so I have some photos from our ribbon skirt workshop. And we've done this one several times. Um, and it's extremely popular. Like, I'm sure we could have it once a month and it would be full. Um, so we try to do these where we'll bring in quite a few sewing machines. And sometimes non-Indigenous sewers come to help too. Uh, because it's a lot of sewing <laughs> to get done in one day if, if all the participants um, get a skirt and it's, it's extremely meaningful for them because some of, some of them have experience with the cultural teachings and some don't. And it's, uh, it's just amazing to see the learning that happens and the sharing, the bonds that happen and, uh, just providing this space in a church feels like we're, helping to right some of the wrongs of the past. And I think that's so important to really dig deep in your own community and find ways to, to offer space and, and offer collaboration and opportunities for indigenous people to regain culture and language. And, and these things happen in these kinds of, in these kinds of workshops. And so this one, we also had a, uh, an outdoor fire pit at lunchtime with uh, music and drumming and singing and stories. And it, it was just a wonderful event and we couldn't have done it without the, the Seeds of Hope grant. And and this is a, this was a, a sharing circle that wrapped up that day. And it's in front of uh, our reconciliation teepee that's in our sanctuary. So this was put up and I believe 2019 or 2020 maybe. And uh, it, it's a teaching tool and a space for people to meet and learn and share. And it's used often. We, every time we have a workshop, we end up doing a circle or something in front of, in front of the teepee. It's a really, really special, uh, a special and meaningful um, teepee that we have. I'm so thankful to the Stony Nakoda nation for, for helping us get that here. And this photo, I, I don't know if you can see on the right, that's the late uh, Nellie Ryder. She was a, uh, um, a spiritual healer, indigenous spiritual healer. So she spoke at the ribbon skirt workshop as well and, and offered one-on-one -on -one healing sessions in our chapel to all of the participants near the end of the day. And it was just an incredible, uh, piece of extra sharing that she did that um, I'm not sure that that was planned. She just offered it near the end of the day and it's transformative. Those kinds of experiences can be transformative for people. And I just want to quickly share a couple other photos that are, aren't from that year, but it just shows how our projects have expanded. This is from this past summer. We did a drum making workshop um, at Stony Nakoda and it, and it was for men. And each of them made a, a a drum out of a buffalo hide, uh, and they and the facilitator uh, Simon Paul he he taught everything, and that was another really amazing workshop. And then the the round dance that I spoke of has evolved <laughs> over the years too. To we're now at the point where we're reaching out to other churches in Calgary. We're forming a South Calgary network of United Churches so that we can share space and share volunteers and resources to meet more needs in the Indigenous communities and for reconciliation and to just expand. So this was a really successful event we had last um, 
last fall on uh, Truth and Recon on the National Truth and Reconciliation Day or Orm Shirt Day, and there was over 110 people attended to Fish Creek United Church, um, and that was possible because of the collaboration and also another uh, funding funding that we got from the United Church Foundation, for which we're very grateful for. Thanks. Well, very exciting. <laughs> it's just, you know, we receive these grants, we approve these grants, and it is our hope that they will be effective, but like, it's just wonderful to see the impact that they've had when we put it in the hands of capable people like uh, the people who are talking to us today. I'd like to take a couple of minutes maybe just to talk a little bit about impact. And um, clearly I'd like to have a sense of the impact this has had, some of these programs have had on your communities of faith, but I maybe wanna challenge you to talk a little bit about, sometimes we don't speak about it that much in the United Church, but what's been the impact on faith among the people who were engaged with you? How has it affected, do you think, their faith? And I'm not suggesting that commitment to justice and commitment to reconciliation is not an integral element of faith, but I think we've also, we're also hoping that the projects that we fund do contribute in some way to the strengthening, the deepening of the faith lives of the people who, who come in contact with them. So could I maybe ask each of you to talk a little bit about impact? And that could be impact you know, more generally, but also if you've got something to say about impact, the impact on the faith of the people who've participated, that would be really welcome too. So does somebody have something on that? You're nodding your head, Michael. I'm gonna to go to you first. I don't know why I always, I'm happy if someone else wants to go first. I, I really want to come to Calgary now and to Peachland and see uh, these amazing projects that are happening. And so thank yeah. you for sharing, my colleagues for sharing. I, I thought of, you know, three different sort of impact stories. And um, I think the first one is is the, my own personal impact. You know, as executive director of Five Oaks, I have the opportunity to attend these programs, which is an amazing opportunity. And, uh, you know, I see this movement in United Church people where we've taken a lot of time to like, soak in right relationship in our brain you know we've done a lot of the head work and now we're finding ways to move it into our heart and into our gut and really process what this what this means for us our own personal faith and, and the faith of our denomination and this is sort of the flow that we need to be moving through uh, i believe when we talk about decolonization when we talk about right relationship um and so you know i think that that's really important i want to share a story about um a participant uh, from Toronto in our Where Cultures Meet uh, program that happened in November this year, she wrote this lovely email uh, a few weeks after the program and, and was really reflecting on her own personal experience of the program and, and the deepening that she experienced, the opportunity that she had to engage with residential school survivors, to engage directly with uh, Six Nations and with the Mohawk Institute and really break into the story and, and under, try to understand what that meant for her. And she said that um, she was really curious and, and deeply moved to move from this sort of like sympathy or guilt mindset and move into further action. And she expressed that, you know, the, the desire some, to sometimes to stay with sympathy or guilt might be a form that she expressed of further racism and that she really wanted to continue to work on this anti-racist approach and that moving towards action out of this experience uh, from this program you know, inspired that. The other example I just wanted to share is um, there were a few members from a church uh, in Huron County that came to the program where cultures meet this past November, and they went back so fired up uh, for their community of faith that they are going to design a where cultures meet in collaboration with us for their own community of faith to come and have a retreat style experience. So it's really interesting to see sort of this epicenter of action moving out. And I really heard, you know, Shauna and Tony explain that, you know, how this one drop has like rippled out. And so you know, that's faith in action. And that's just so exciting. But I'm excited to hear uh, Ian and Tony and Shauna how that the impact for you. Well, Shauna and Tony, maybe we, we can turn to you as well. The impact that you've seen, obviously you've had some impact, but but maybe a little bit a little bit more on the, the, the faith dimension of that impact. What is it doing for people's understanding of what it means to be God's people in this time, in this place? Do you want to start, Tony? I'll start. Um, Tony's brother, Reverend John Snow, um, said said something. Um, he said, uh, "You know, what are you what are you called to do, or what it, what are you yeah what are you called to do?" And and I always come back to that for myself personally. And 
really think about my own faith journey and where I'm at spiritually and to for myself to feel grounded in that and then be able to you know share whatever talents or gifts that I have and I think that's a really good starting point for any churches that haven't really done this kind of work before is just to look deep inside yourself and see see if you can find those special talents those things that you're good at whether it's writing letters to the government or whether it's you know doing music or or whatever that is like behind behind me is our reconciliation mural that we had yeah. 72 plus artists indigenous non-indigenous two years old up to 94 years old do these paintings and because I come from an art background so that's I worked with the uh, family minister here, Dana Cox, Reverend Dana Cox, and um, planned this project. And so I, I think that for me, faith comes from what your what your own personal strengths are. And I think that can it's another thing that can ripple out in the community if you can tap into that yourself and find that in other people and start collaborating and working together. I like that, you know, to look in yourself to see what you're called to do. It reminds me of the famous hymn, you know, uh, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? <laughs> it's sort of like listening for that voice and recognizing that voice might end up being kind of challenging, but it's it's going to be based in in some strength and not just your own strength, but other strength that will come to you if uh, if you step up to the challenge. I don't know if we lost Tony along the way. I don't yeah, I, I had a yeah. problem with my connection, it looked like, so I was offline there for a bit. Uh, one of the things yeah. that I think is really important in terms of that uh, transition in our faith and in our practice, uh, we signed as a denomination the uh, Residential School Settlement Agreement in 2008 and made commitments around uh, seeking this reconciliation and furthered that commitment in 2015 with the recommendations from the TRC and the calls to action. And those, um, I think, seem insurmountable at times. And I think that for a long time, that five-year uh, time period after the signing, um, the, with the sort of input from uh, Senator uh, Murray Sinclair talking about how there hasn't been much movement within that. And so one of the things that this has allowed us to do is through partnership and through working in a community-minded way to shift that perspective of the insurmountable into the doable, into something that we can work with, something that we can encourage each other to do in these small ways, and to build up our resiliency by flexing that uh, reconciliation muscle in order to uh, understand what it takes to engage in these ways and to continue that journey uh, because this is an intergenerational thing and it has to expand beyond uh, the one or two events, the one or two exercises, the one or two uh, things that we do uh, for ourselves, but to really embed a practice of uh, being in a recon uh, reconciling manner to the outward community so that we are continuing to bring that spirit into the work that we do not just with Indigenous people and our local neighbours, which is important, but to those that come here needing our heart, needing our guidance, needing our um, support. And, and that is for all newcomers and for all others that come from uh, broken places, wounded places, refugees and others uh, that seek uh, a humane and benevolent society. And I think that by doing this, we are helping to facilitate what that is. And that becomes more of the, the faith journey of the individual communities and the individual practitioners that are helping out that can help us to build something that is more resilient for the future. Thank you, Tony. And back to Peachland, maybe for a quick observation from Ian about the, the, the impact, especially the impact on the faith of the, of the people in your community of faith. Yeah, to, um, so this, this story in this exercise is not one that is um, directed at making people feel guilt. It's information about history and uh, transformation is what we're hopeful 
when you ask that question, I think about the transformative experience of this as a gospel lesson. We're always looking in our worship for how we walk uh, along with Jesus in life and in faith. One thing powerful about this kind of story is if people experience it, boy, do you have an understanding about a story in current times that we can relate to history and the gospel of faith. We can relate it to what's going on in Palestine and Gaza and any of these sort of things. So the transformation piece as far as what the gospel shows us and how we move into faith and understanding is a story that people can bring from this. Again, not trying to make them feel guilt, but making us understand that these stories that we, we hear about that were written 2,000 years ago are right in front of us right now. And if we want to grow in our faith, the Indigenous story through something like the blanket exercise is a powerful, powerful example of such a story. What we're hearing today definitely sounds like good news to me. So um, <laughs> an important point you make there, Ian. We want to turn now to to you, to the, to the folks who are participating and have been up until this point listening and watching. Um, Okay, so I, once again, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, and if you are part of a community of faith, let us know what your community of faith is, and uh, and, and and yeah, please, um, Hillary. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I will try and make this brief. Um, my name is Hillary Hillary Kitson. I'm calling. I'm watching from the um, unceded and stolen lands of the Hokkien speaking people. Um, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and, and the Squamish-speaking people on the west coast of Vancouver, uh, west coast of Canada in what's called Vancouver. Um, I, I have some comments and a cup question. Um, so thank you for this. Um, I'm with the Canadian Memorial United Church in Vancouver and part of a group called the Reconciliation Seekers that has been seeking to learn more about this for the past eight years since the walk with the TRC in 2013. Um, I really appreciate what, what Michael and, and Tony have said about um, looking at how the things that we do have an impact. And thank you, Royal, for asking that question, um, because sometimes the things we do can seem like we've ticked the box. And unless we make change in ourselves, there isn't a lot happening. And I'm interested to know because I feel there's a slight self-congratulatory tone to some of the discussion. You know, look what we're doing. Royal, you're saying that you're excited about these projects. But if nothing changes on the ground, all we're doing is congratulating ourselves, if you see what I mean. Um, Fair point. Fair point. Can I ask you to move to your question, Hillary? Just because I I see lots of hands have come up okay. already. Um, two but things. Fair then. point. Very yeah. Very fair. Point. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to ask Ian um, when he was talking about educating the congregation about Canada before colonization, why he called it Canada and why he didn't call it Turtle Island. And I want to make a suggestion or a question, how many people here know whether their congregation, if they are in the United Church, has looked at Remit 1 and has voted on it and has sent it in? Because if we... <laughs> okay, and I'll stop there. Great, 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 both great points, especially that remit one. Thank you for putting that into the mix. Ian, do you have a, a, a quick response? Quick answer, uh, Hillary, absolutely 1,000% correct. Turtle Island would have been a much better, yeah, because Canada was, as far as Indigenous people were concerned, uh, Canada was a name uh, they had no idea about. It was their land and it wasn't Canada. Um, remit, we have talked about it in our faith community and we have sent in a remit and we passed it. All right. Thank you, Hillary, for that comment. Jess, who's up next? Um, let's go to Pamela. All right. Hi, thank, thank you. I'm uh, Pamela Mowdy, and I'm from Westminster United Church in Orangeville. I'm um, part of the outreach team there and also do the youth um, programming. So my question actually is for you, Michael. Um, as an outdoor educator as well with young children, I kind of combined all that. And I was really keen on hearing maybe just a little tiny bit more about how you um, did the uh, land-based decolonization types of programs. Um, just a little bit more about that would be helpful. 
Sure. I'll also say, because we're going to run out of time, we're not all going to get to say everything we want. Five Oaks is a great website. My email address is on there. Anybody wants to connect with me, I'm happy to about any of this. And Five Oaks is happy to share anything with anyone. We developed this uh, curriculum in collaboration with Indigenous elders and with forest school educators. Uh, we, we saw a void in opportunities for students to learn about diversity in their school. Uh, and part of that is also to learn about Indigenous education and, and Indigenous ceremony and teachings. Uh, and so we've co-created this curriculum. Uh, and so offering it as field trips to our site. And, and the, the quick little tagline is that humans learn best about human diversity in the diversity of the forest. So using the forest as a teacher uh, and an educator for us to understand that when we're interconnected and we, when we grow together, um, we can really uh, deepen into one another. And Five Oaks has these two woodlots. One is this ancient Carolinian forest, which is thriving and healthy. And another is a planted pine grove of all the same species of trees, which is currently dying. So it's like this really stark uh your reminder and Pamela if you send me an email I'd be happy to share more about the curriculum with you um, but it's a really exciting opportunity. Thank you. Thank you Pamela for that question. I just want to mention one comment we've received in the chat if you don't have your chat open I think this one's important from Tina Conlon. I'm a community minister at Davenport Perth after doing a blanket exercise I've implored to do one in Spanish as well. Basically, she recounts how they did this, a lot of it with people who are new Canadians or part of diasporic communities um, and who recognized the experience of colonization that their own people had uh, had had experienced in the past. And I think it's just an interesting uh, reminder that these things can gather in new people into your community of faith in ways that might not be possible. So the process of reconciliation can become a way to open up to a much wider community than uh, than maybe currently exists in your community of faith. So thank you, Kina, Tina, for that comment. Um, Jess, who, ha who have we got next in terms of a spoken contribution here? Douglas, are you? Hello. Thank you. I'm Doug Troop, and I live on the territory of the Ghanaian Gahaga, which is actually right next door here. Uh, I live on the south shore of Montreal and a minister at Mountainside United Church uh, that used to be in Upper West Mount and is now homeless. We uh, sold in our renting, and we voted in favor of the remit last December to answer that question. Uh, and uh, where I'm located, just an anecdote of Woodlot, I walked because we are not getting seasonal weather and walked along uh, the Chinese rapids, Nashim. When the Europeans came up this far, they encountered the rapids and decided this was China. Uh, so there was a beaver uh, across from the city of Montreal, a beaver busily working uh, with the warmer weather. Wonderful. Uh, my question was, and I think Michael answered in part, uh, what is the relation to Indigenous uh, leadership? How is their supervision, reflection? I, I believe of praxeology. You know, it, it, we can go on our own without uh, any reflection or wisdom from that community. And I wonder how that is happening. I, I saw perhaps, I'm sorry, I can't uh, see uh, Reverend Tony. That would be helpful. I knew Reverend John Snow in, in, uh, of times past, but that question about what is the connection here? I'd like to pick up on that one. Michael, Tony, how do we ensure that the, there's appropriate leadership um, uh, coming around the table? And it certainly sounds to me like uh, in both your projects, certainly in Calgary, um, that's been built in right from the start and sounds like it's an essential part of success. I'll just speak to that a little bit. Um, one of the uh, things that we're doing is building upon the competencies and expertise of local community members and using the the resources to actually a lot of them are not employed so using that to, to help to shore up them with uh, some funding to be able to do these things so we have uh, people who are renowned experts in in their area to do these works and to bring uh, the authentic voice of indigenous people into this so that they're speaking from a community and free speaking from a tradition uh, that is uh, verified and validated by the groups that they're involved with so they've been taught by them and it's it's not uh, the more generic information that you would hear from any other uh, person local to the community it's actually embedded in the practices of the land and of the people there which is an important part I think that 
every one of us coming from different parts of the country will have a very different understanding if we work with our local communities and how they uh, have built their relationship with the land. It's a different context in every situation. And so the different teachings, the different ways, our expansive way of knowing we can bring that together as a church and help to uh, facilitate that understanding. So it's not merely uh, seven grandfather teachings, which doesn't apply to all people uh, and these different sort of uh, milieus that that uh, people step into when they try to do this work. There's sometimes a tendency to overgeneralize or do things in a way that may not suit uh, elders and community members, practitioners. And we have to have that balance between the community input, the community uh, support and our work outside of that community to help facilitate it. And the best way to do that is to encourage the voices and the participation of people from the reserves and from the uh, various indigenous communities around us. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time here, but I think this is really a critical issue. And so I would welcome any perspective that either Ian or, or Michael have on this one, because the, this issue of how do we ensure the right kind of leadership just seems to me crucial. So Ian, Michael, any perspective on that in terms of how you've built this into what you're doing? Go ahead, Michael. Um, okay. At the heart of the work that Five Oaks is committed to is, is bringing and centering the voices that are on the margins and centering those voices within the leadership and, and the design. And that's a, sometimes a complex conversation to have and Tony what I'm really picking up on is like this what's the word local 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 and it's like really un like understanding your local context and really amplifying that context and I think that's that's what Five Oaks is really trying to do you know so it's like how do I understand the the people that live in my community um who are the indigenous elders that are helping to facilitate uh this work you know Nations Uniting in Six Nations is a huge supporter and a partner in the work that Five Oaks does it's a mission and service uh, organization on six nations so you know I, I think that's what i would add to tony's comments and i can and the thing is, is i can only bring my own body to the story you know i'm bringing my full self to the story and inviting others to come to the circle and bring their full body to the story and when we're standing in circle together fully embodied in who we are i think we become richer and deeper and, and more faithful so ian I, quick comment I would just yeah quickly add i mean everything you said is thousand percent right but any kinds of to move forward in reconciliation means building relationships and we can't build relationships among our church communities in isolation we have to build them honestly and slowly remember stan mckay uh, reverend stan mckay had a chat with him a couple of years ago on a project i was doing and ian it took us whatever 150 years to get here it's going to take us a long time in reconciliation we have to be patient and we have to do that, Michael, just as you said, in relationship with folks in our local communities, not in tokenism, but in trying to build real relationships with our Indigenous friends. And that takes a lot of doing, a lot of patience, and we have to go forward. But without that, we don't really, we can't hope to really uh, uh, move forward uh, in true reconciliation without that. Great. Thank you. I want to just do a couple of the mechanics of what we have now. We're approaching one o'clock at my time in terms of when we're gonna wrap this. There've been some really great comments coming in the chat. If you haven't opened up the chat, maybe we can invite you to pop that open and just kind of scroll through those. Please add your own comments there. And I think Jess, we can kind of keep it open for a few minutes afterwards, even when we stop our conversations just so people have a chance to read those chats and pick up on some of the useful information. I see that Eric, for example, dropped in uh, the, uh, the, the URL for Five Oaks and there's so there's useful stuff in there. So please check out the chat before you go and contribute to it if you're able. Um, it has been really a great pleasure uh, to, to host this and to welcome Michael Schuberg from the Five Oaks Centre in Brantford, Ontario, Ian McLean from Peachfield United in Peach, uh, Peach Land, rather, United in Peachland, BC, and Shauna Kennedy and the Reverend Tony Smith from McDougall United in Calgary, Alberta. Thank you for taking time to share with us. We really appreciate it.
appreci appreciate this. This is one in a series of webinars that we've been planning from the foundation called Work in Action. Today's was, of course, towards reconciliation with indigenous people. Uh, a few people have mentioned Seeds of Hope grants and how important they have been for the work that they've been done. I just want to mention a couple of things about Seeds of Hope. One is that the new, uh, the, the new version of Seeds of Hope, the application period has opened. So please check out the website of the foundation. And if you've got a great idea, send it to us. Uh, we really, really are excited to receive receive uh, these kinds of applications. And I think we've already heard from some of the people here today how important those little bits of, of support can be. And it's certainly a pleasure for us to partner with local communities of faith who are doing the kinds of things we've done. Um, at the foundation, I think we kind of think of ourselves as the hope wing of the national church. That is to say, we have a confident expectation that the United Church of Canada, through its local communities of faith, can, can continue to contribute um, to justice and love and God's mercy and God's presence in our local communities. Uh, we are in the business of gathering together the resources um, and managing those resources in ways that allow us to invest in the future of the United Church through projects like the exciting projects you've heard today. So once again, from the foundation, thank you all for for participating, especially our panelists today. Uh, it has been a total pleasure working with you today. Jess, is there anything we need to do in terms of wrap up at this point? Uh, no, I just want to remind everybody this is being recorded um, and we will send it out to you and it'll also be on the United Church um, of Canada uh, YouTube page and we'll we uh, I'll collect all of the comments from the chat as well and maybe I'll compile those into a little digest in the email as well and if you have any more questions please feel free to email them to us fdn at united-church.ca um, and we can pitch them out to our panelists and if they feel like they have some time to answer them we can include that as well um, other than that thank you all for for coming today uh, we want to of course uh, highlight these awesome projects and showcase the kinds of things that Seeds of Hope can bring to life. But really, we, we want you to come away with something um, that you can reflect on, something actionable that you can take back to your um, your families and your friends and your communities of faith and your wider communities. So um, this is our, our, our best attended webinar ever. That's a great reflection of the, uh, the, the, the spirit moving through everybody across our church um, and a heart for this kind of work. So there will be more, I'm sure, just like this. And uh, hope to see everybody at our next webinar. Thanks, everybody.